everyone, I am Jessica Bell from My Wine School, where it is wine your way. Everyone say hello to my sister Karen, I'm our Hi. resident chef. Oh goodness, I don't think the camera's on. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, it's, like, it's hard to see her if the camera's not on. Let's try that. That's okay, I don't mind. Right, don't she's just camera. missing. Oh, there she is. Hi. Oh, look at that. Power of... Uh, <laughs> Oh, this is gonna be a fun time today, guys. I see, I see Emily, Nancy, I see Michael's over there. Um, I see a lot of people already signed in. And if you don't know how to sign in and say hello, uh, it's real easy. If you're watching live, right off to the right, you're gonna see chat with MWS. Right under audience, just type anything in. It'll take you to this screen. You can either log in or sign up. If you sign up, it's only about five fields and boom, you are a part of the conversation. So here we are at Winecast number 33 and it is for uh, our wine explorers. We have three levels, wine newbie, wine explorer, and wine guru. And we're gonna be rolling out the three levels, uh, hopefully mid 2012. But in the meantime, we're trying to build the viewership. So tell your friends what we're up to and invite them over for to share that bottle with you. So today we're gonna be doing marketing and wine, okay? Um, that's a big topic. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm even tackling this topic, but we're gonna be using Three Thieves, uh, the show. Uh, it's a Malbec and it's from 2010, Mendoza, Argentina. I'm already getting in some good comments on the wine. The wine is good, Michael mentioned, I see that. Um, we'd love to know what wines you guys have. I always tell you, just open a bottle if you don't have the wine we've got. We'd love to know what you've got. And not only that today, I would love to see what your labels look like, okay? So if you have a mobile phone with a camera on it, go ahead and take a picture of your label and upload it up onto our Facebook page, okay? Because then we can see it in real time what you're drinking. Um, and it's, uh, let's see, facebook.com backslash mywineschool. So we're gonna take a look later at what labels get posted. We'd love to see what you guys are, are drinking tonight. So, um, like I said, this is a big topic to tackle. And, you know, Kieran, you've had your own business. You had your own restaurant in Madrid. And um, was marketing important for you? Yeah, it was extremely important. Um, in fact, although I don't think I really realized it at the time, at the time, the most important um, marketing thing that I did was as simple as just defining the cuisine, mm -hmm. which I did as Californian cuisine, which in Spain no one had even heard of. So it... It created a lot of curiosity, buzz, I got a lot of press coverage for it, and it was the most important thing, I think, the most important key to the success of my business. It was, it was something so simple that I was not even, even intending it for it to be a marketing tactic. Right, and it was brilliant because, like you said, you were in a group or a city full of, of restaurants, and how do you distinguish yourself? Through marketing, and you, you were so smart, you didn't even know yeah. how smart you are, and you, you labeled it as California cuisine. So people say, well, what, what's California cuisine? I, I wanna go check it out. And then that got people in the door, but it was your cooking and the quality that kept people there. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the wine world. There's certain ways you can get people to buy the bottle, but you have to have a good wine for people to come back later. And I really think in today's world for marketing, especially in wine, where there is so much diversity and accessibility of product, marketing cannot be an afterthought. It has to be, it ha the business relies on marketing and you have to stand out among the crowd as Karen did with her restaurant. Now, um, I do recognize that there are two-year programs solely devoted to marketing and wine. So um, I wanna manage expectations that we have 15 to 20 minutes here today, and I'm going to um, uh, work within that space. But my goal today is to help you understand an abbreviated version of wine marketing over the last 100 years. Okay, really abbreviated. But what I'm hoping is that Understanding the past will help you anticipate the future. And by the end, I'm gonna ask you what you think the future holds for wine marketing. So you better be better be listening. I'm gonna be calling on you guys. Um, and of course, wine classes are no fun if you don't have wine to drink with them. Okay, so we've got a great wine here today. Um, we're gonna be doing, uh, like I said, the, the show from Three Thieves. So let's go back in time a little. We're gonna go back to the 1930s when prohibition ended. Now, obviously, you, uh, U.S. residents were consuming wine prior to that, 
back to the 1850s, we saw you know um, uh, lots of wineries in California, but we also saw Ben Franklin even further back. Ben, ben Franklin loved wine, talked about wine, planted wine in Virginia. So wine has always been a part of our, our uh, uh, culture, but a small part, definitely in the 1930s. In fact, I was able to find a great resource, which I highly recommend you checking out. It's the wineinstitute.org. And I found a chart that had the per capita consumption of US residents from 19, I think 31, 32, 33, to 2010, which really helped me um, uh, structure how I was gonna understand wine marketing in the US. So this is interesting. In 1933, the per capita consumption for the year was 0.25 gallons. I think I consumed that in a night. I mean, right? Okay, I mean, that's... I did last night. I did last night, yes. I'm going to turn red now, and it's all out there. Yes, I did have a good time last night with my three sisters. We all went out for some wine, and I just kept kept the ordering coming. So, um, so 0.25 gallons per year, that is very, very small. And so at this point... The marketing strategies included um, getting it to the store, okay? So um, not a whole lot going on there. But what's interesting now is that you have from uh, 1937 to 1967, it takes 30 years, three decades, for that per capita consumption to double. Again, probably the extent of marketing was what's being produced near us and what's at the store. So there really wasn't a whole lot, I would say, going into this concept of marketing. There wasn't the diversity of product that you now see on the shelves in America. Not even close, okay? Now this is where it gets really interesting. So it took 30 years to double, but it only took 10 years from 1968 to 1978 to double it again. So something is going on from 1968 to 1978. And I want to see what you guys know about the history of wine. So I'm going to check in with you with the first Wine IQ. This is Wine Interactive Question, meant to get you involved, number one. And I want to know which of the following important wine-related events took place in the years between 1968 and 1978. Was it A, the French Paradox, B, Robert Mondavi started his winery, C, Beaujolais Nouveau arrived in the U.S., or D, the Paris tasting of California and French wine. Now, this is a tough one. Let me, while you're thinking about that one, let me just uh, give you a short description of what each of these things even are. So, the French paradox, uh, 60 Minutes um, had a, a report, a news story, about the fact that the French have lower heart disease, uh, have lower weights, and yet drink more wine and eat more uh, fat, fat-laden foods. So that was the French paradox. Uh, B, Robert Mondavi, he is known as the grandfather of modern winemaking in the U.S. So, you know, when did he start his winery? Uh, C, Beaujolais Nouveau. Beaujolais Nouveau is a wine from France, which uh, a very a genius in marketing uh, came up with this idea that Every third Thursday in November, this region of Beaujolais would release their new wine. So Nouveau means new, meaning it was just harvested only a couple months earlier. And what that did was create attention on the region of Beaujolais every year at this time, at the third Thursday of November. Brilliant, okay. The last thing is the Paris tasting of California and French wine. A very understated tasting occurred in Paris where they asked some California uh, vintners to give them wine and they put them up against some very famous French wines, expecting the French wines to blow the California wines out of the water. Well, you can guess what happened. The California wines won. So let's see what people are coming in on uh, uh, the wine IQ. What do you see, Karen? So far, everyone's saying D. D. Okay, great. And you know, um, I should have mentioned you could pick two. So if you want to pick another one, go ahead and pick another one. But you guys are right on D. And it's actually called the 1976 Paris Tasting or the Paris Tasting of 1976. So that is a good indicator of uh, the date, obviously. But there's another one. Um, and I think Michael got it. It's B. Robert Mondavi started his winery. Yeah, he started his winery in 1966. And I do, do not think that is a coincidence that he started his winery in 1966 and from 1968 to 78 we saw a doubling of consumption in the U.S. Um, I will say A, the French paradox happened in 1991, just to give you a little perspective. Uh, I mentioned B happened in 1966 and then C, 
Interesting. It actually, the idea started probably around this time in the 1970s, but it really didn't hit America until the mid 80s. So it, didn't, it wasn't relevant to our wine uh, consumption until then. Okay, so Robert Mondavi obviously was a big instigator, not instigator, he was a big promoter of, uh, of cons consumption and production of wine in the U.S. So let's take a look at one of his first labels. This is, I, I pulled this off of sellertracker.com, and this was one of his first labels. Now, right now, it looks pretty standard, right? You're like, well, what's the big deal? This was a huge deal. That Cabernet Sauvignon in big letters, that's a big deal for 1968. Um, what's, what happened prior to that was we saw a lot of European wine or US producers mimicking European wine. And in Europe, there's, uh, an, there are laws that state you have to label your wine by the geography, by where it's from. And it's actually up until recently has been illegal to put grape varietals on the label. So here's this big change when we see not only the grape varietal on the label, but it's a big part of the label. It's probably the biggest font on the label here. So that was hu a huge step, uh, which really allowed to, br which really helped make wine more accessible to the U.S. consumer. So what's interesting, let's get back to the wine we have today because I love talk, you know, using wine as example to learn. And here, can I let you be Vanna? How about that? If you could get that nice and close. If you look at this label, you see that Malbec, which is the grape, is big. Again, it's probably one of the, the largest fonts, maybe just a little smaller than the show at the top, but Malbec is there. It is hard to miss. And because it's easy to see, it's also easy to understand the wine. If you've ever had a Malbec before, now you can understand what that wine might be like. And so instead of understanding wines by region, the U.S. consumer could start understanding wines by grape. And it allowed us to use a more simple language for wine. We no longer had to invest all this time in understanding maps and history. It, it allowed us to, you know, we were hundreds of years behind the European wine consumer. And yet in just a couple years time or a couple decades, we were able to kind of catch up with them and be able to talk about wine in a useful way that helped us sell and, and um, produce the wine, or not produce it, sell and consume, right? Okay. Um, so something else that Robert Mondavi did was he it was, again, the grandfather of, or father, however, you know, he's, he's an old guy, you know, he's dead now, sorry. Um, but <laughs> it's not funny, but... <laughs> I just, this is what happens when it's live. You can't, you can't edit it out, you know, but um, fantastic man, a visionary, not only in wine, but in marketing. So if you ever want to have a lesson in marketing, he is one to watch. I mean, he came up with a whole nother type of wine called Fumé Blanc, which he created and it, it, it's taken on a life of its own and that's power. But another thing he did was he was one of the first to introduce modern winemaking. So that included things like stainless steel, some French oak barrels. And not only that, but he was doing it in California where it was a lot warmer than a place like France. And what the result in these wines was fruit, lots and lots of fruit. So go ahead and the wine that we have today is in that style. It has, it's new world, it has fruit. But I want you to go ahead and check out the wine. This is our wine IQ number two. I want to know what you guys smell on the wine. So do you smell fruit, earth, spice, or other? Or you can even get more specific on it. Get as specific as you like. And um, while you're doing that, let me just put this into perspective, the idea of uh, uh, what you smell and, and how it translates to sales. I want you to think about coffee. Now, you might smell coffee in here, but that's not why I want you to smell about smell. That's not why I want you to think about coffee. Um, the reason is usually your first cup of joe is not black. It usually has some kind of cream or sugar in it. An old world wine can be like that black coffee. It's a bit of an acquired taste and it's because it has higher acid and tannin. It has higher, it's higher in things that are a bit astringent. So for an inexperienced drinker, which the U.S. consumer was at that point, it's just I mean, if you look at the per capita, we were not experienced drinkers, then European wines could be a little harsh, kind of like that first cup of black coffee that you have. But a wine like this one and the wines that Mondavi was making were more fruit forward. They were cleaner too, I'd say. 
uh, less of this funkiness going on. And uh, he was doing it as, as well as his cohort was doing this. And, and this really helped drive sales, I think. This is my, this is my opinion. So I want to know what people are getting on, on the wines. Can anyone come in on uh, smells? Not yet. How about you? I'll put you on the spot. Okay. What do you um, smell? I, I smell quite a bit of, of fruit, black fruit. Mm -hmm. And then I also was getting a little hint of anise. Maybe? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, perfect. You're going to get a lot of fruit on this. Um, yeah, I had you know some sweet spices, some spicy spices. Now we have Nancy coming in with fruit and spice, and Michael also saying spice. Perfect, yeah. Um, sorry, I snuck in a sip there. And by the way, go ahead and drink uh you can you can uh, skip ahead uh well, there's no there's no rules about that just want you to have a good time well perfect so you know um so you see kind of that that new world style on on this wine which really helps sell it. it it helped people come back to it so i mentioned it was the label or the the marketing that gets people to try it but it's this it's the taste that will keep people coming back now so it's interesting from 1978 to about the mid 90s, even late 1990s, the, the per capita consumption in the US really jumped around. It, it, it spiked a little, but what's interesting is that if you look at the 1978 consumption, per capita consumption, 1.96 gallons, and then 1998, 20 years later, it's even just a little bit under. Now, I will say within that time period, there were jumps. It got up to about 2.5 at one point. And that may have been attributed to things like the French Paradox or Beaujolais Nouveau, but it's interesting that it, nothing was a permanent change, if you will. Uh, I think Beaujolais Nouveau was a bit trendy and, and it had a, a temporary uh, effect, as was the French Paradox. But the labeling, the varietal, uh, the varietal labeling um, had a permanent change. And, and, and so that's what I'm looking for here, are permanent changes in marketing strategy that lead to a permanent change in per capita consumption. Now, I'd like to say that um, the reason why this stayed the same for this time period was because I was born in 1978 and I did not become legal until 2001. I, you know, I'm just saying, the numbers match up. Suddenly, in 2001, okay, well, 1999 to 2010, it has just steadily increased. So... I'm just saying, okay. So, um, but it has, it has never dipped down. So something's going on in the last decade that makes wine consumption, again, a per there's a permanent change in marketing. And now, to understand that, we really have to go back uh, to uh, 1996, okay? In 1996, before obviously the steady increase, the Australians said, you know, we want to become big wine producers. And so they did this study commissioned uh, by the Australian Wine Foundation or Federation. And Deloitte did a study that tuned in to what the U.S. consumer's preferences and buying habits were. And they came back and said, okay, the U.S. Uh, uh, consumer likes uh, fruitier wine. They like bright labels with critters on them. Okay, now, the, the study didn't say that exactly. It, it was more elaborate. They paid a lot of money for that study. It was a little bit more elaborate than that. But, um, you know, I, I, that was part of it, part of the study. And I don't think it's any coincidence that in 2000, Yellowtail was founded. And if you don't know what Yellowtail was, you've seen it before. It's the bright yellow label with a kangaroo on the front. And I think, and if anyone knows this out there, I think it's the most sold wine in the U.S. If not the most sold, it is one of the most sold wines in the U.S. Um, in 2001, it sold about 112,000 cases. By 2005, it was already selling 7.5 million cases. Okay, that is a huge jump. So that's my second thing that I think is a permanent change in marketing, which is labels. And again, this wine that we've got today is a perfect example of a good looking label. So if you could show them this label again, and I wanna see your labels too. We'll see if, well, after um, uh, Kieran's done holding the wine, I'll, um, I'll have her check out the Facebook page, or if Emily, if you could check out the Facebook page and tell us if anyone's um, posted any of their labels. But part of that, I mean, if that label doesn't get you, I don't know what does. It draws you in. And it, it has an animal on it, you know? And it, I mean, it's got bright colors. And, and this was a new thing. I mean, remember what Robert Mondavi's label looked like? Okay, a lot different, right? So 
we've got um, not only a change of labels, but like you showed on the back there, Karen, there's a story mm-hmm. too. And that's another thing that uh, Yellowtail and a lot of these Australian companies got really good at was telling the story for you on the back of the label. And um, this wine is no stranger to a good story. So the Three Thieves, fantastic name, the Three Thieves are comprised of these three dudes, really smart dudes. Okay. And actually their names are on the, the bottom of that label there, if you look right here. Okay. So we've got Joel Gott, Charles Beeler, and Roger Skomenia. Okay. And what they did is they, they recognized a big hole in the market. And what was happening was these unbelievable California wineries were just producing too many grapes. And so they saw, okay, there's all these grapes and you're not making wine with it. Well, we'll buy it really cheap. And we're going to pass on those savings to you. So you were getting this amazing wine at this great price. And, you know, it was like a modern day wine Robin Hood. Who doesn't like Robin Hood, right? I mean, these guys have a fantastic story. And it's, it's not only the story, but you've got to like the wine after you've been drawn in with the label and the story. So I want to know what you think of the wine, okay? I mean, I I like it, but I want to know what you think about it. And tell me, you know, any any kind of feedback you want on this wine. Uh, so I have one, oh, are there any labels on the Facebook page, yeah, by the way? Yeah, one person, um, Emily said that Jeff, let's see, Jeff B posted a pic on his bottle of Honig. Okay, Honig. Okay, great. So check out on our Facebook page. Jeff has a, a bottle of the Honig, and I don't have the Facebook page in front of me, but if it's the same label, it's a pretty simple label. It's usually white and real simple looking label, which is, you know, there's something to be said about a simple label too. When there's a lot of stuff going on on the shelf, a simple label really stands out. So um, great. Anyone else, go ahead and post some pictures for us. We'd love to see what you've got. So now I have one more... I have one more big change I've seen. So I uh, got varietally labeled l- labels, okay? Uh, and then bright, attractive labels with stories. And now here's the third thing. The third thing that I've seen even very recently in the last five to six years is this marketing strategy which has, it creates an emotional connection with a wine or wine in general, just wine, uh, or a specific wine, or even wine people. And I'm going to use one very lucid example, and that was Sideways, the movie Sideways in 2004. It changed the way people talked about wine. I personally saw it when I, uh, I was a sommelier in New York at the Modern, and uh, we had a fantastic red burgundy list. For those of you who don't know, red burgundy, most always on a list, is going to be Pinot Noir. Okay? So they, people would come in and they said, I got to have a Pinot Noir. I said, oh, great. I got this great burgundy for you. And they'd look at me like I was absolutely bonkers. Like I, I like had a hole in my head. I wasn't listening to them. And it was because they demanded Pinot Noir because of the way the movie talked about the wine and talked about the grape itself. It was really interesting to see. I don't think uh, Sideways is the only uh, medium or movies are the only medium that are using this emotional connection. I also see it with uh, blogs in general, video blogs, and now social media. And we've got... Uh, Emily, I got to give a big shout out to her because she is uh, uh, heading the pack for My Wine School on the social media. So she's doing a fantastic job. And I think this all falls under this category of an emotional connection with wine. Somehow you're, you're creating that. And, you know, I really think this is paramount for the, that movie or other forms is that it can really connect with the consumer on a psychologically deeper level an emotional level. And what does that do? It creates loyalty. And that is very rare to come by, first of all, for the U.S. consumer, but the U.S. wine consumer. It's, it's, a, it's the elusive, uh, uh, it's very elusive in the wine world. So this wine, again, is also doing that. This is a fantastic wine today uh, to illustrate all these ideas. And um, it's a wine that's called The Show, Because these three guys have actually created a show where they go and find the perfect vineyard, the perfect grapes to make a wine that they think would be fantastic for the U.S. market. And and it's, it's a TV show. And so what, I mean, it's brilliant. When you go and visit a place, you come home and what do you want to do? You want to drink that wine, right? And now you're creating this emotional connection to these three guys. You're kind of going on a a trip without leaving your home. And then you kind of get thirsty and think, I want to drink with these guys, right? I want to drink the wine that we just all shared on this trip. So a fantastic idea. Um, 
Now, um, I want to know, did anyone comment on the wine? I want to see yeah, what they thought um, of it. a couple comments. Michael said that he's really liking it a lot. <clears throat> and uh, another uh, topic, he says we definitely need more time on this topic. Yeah. Michael did. Definitely. I know I'm at like 25 minutes <laughs> in. I got to like bloop, 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 get fast. Um, but Kim didn't seem to like it too much. She says it seems a bit raw, a little off balance, but can't put my finger on it. Maybe high tannins. Okay. Okay, um, you know, and it, it depends also um, if you're uh, drinking it by itself. And I don't know if she has the um, uh, the show. Uh, I would say, you know, grab a piece of cheese if it's too much tannin for you. Or grab something to eat. That will really help. Anything with um, a little bit of salt uh, will really bring down that uh, stringency for you. So, um, yeah, and you know, it's all relative. A high tannin wine for someone would be on the lower side for someone else. So, um, you know, I, I think that a wine can shine in any circumstance. You just gotta find the right place for it for you, too. Anything else, Karen? Um, Hippie Boy <laughs> says that um, wines that rock have a cool marketing strategy and the wine um, isn't bad either. Okay, great. So, so you're loving the that. marketing strategy and, and it's good, you're gonna come back for it, right? Because you enjoy mm -hmm. the wine. And this is a fantastic price, too. I mean, these come in definitely under 20 um, and it depends where you're getting it, but you can really get some great prices on it. I'd love to know what you guys all paid for it out there. So, um, well, good. So this, you know, um, you, you know, just to summarize, because I kind of went through this pretty quickly. I really think that there's been three permanent changes uh, as a result of marketing. You've got um, uh, the change in uh, varietal labeling. So putting like Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot or Chardonnay on a label has made a big difference uh, in uh, marketing. Uh, and then attractive labels, cool labels, and a great story and being able to tell that story too. And then of course an emotional connection. Now, this is where I, I, I'm gonna turn to you guys. I wanna know what's the next thing, right? What is the next thing that is really going to create a permanent change in per capita consumption. I would love to hear what anyone else, uh, else has to say. Are there any questions out there? We'll see if anyone's brave enough to come in with a comment on uh, what I just asked. But um, any other comments? No, well, maybe you could comment. Sue was asking if anyone had heard of Radio Boca Tempranillo. Radio Boca? I haven't. I would love to know if any of you guys have heard of it. I, You know, it sounds a little familiar, but I definitely have not tried it before. So. And just another comment that Wines That Rock, Michael was saying it's not available in Wisconsin. So. Wines That Rock? Yeah. Oh, okay. So Wines That Rock is not available in Wisconsin. Well, that's a bummer, right? Um, okay. Um, well, I, we'll see if anyone comes in on uh, the, the, the idea. Keep a, do you see anything? No, not yet, but okay. if you want to keep it going, um, Michael, uh, earlier in the in the program, recommended um, the book M Mondavi, Rise and Fall of a Dynasty. Oh, it's great. It's a very interesting read. So. Okay, great. Mondavi, the, the, what was it called? Mondavi? Rise and Fall of a Dynasty. Rise and Fall of a Dynasty. Interesting. I was just reading a lot about Mondavi today, and uh, it was interesting because he did mention how he was disappointed in his son's for going down the road of more mass-produced wines and not staying true to what he started, which was a, a focus on quality wine. So that that title kind of implies maybe that fall, that rise and fall. I think they're doing pretty good. They sold it for like, I don't know, a couple billion dollars. <laughs> I don't think you can fall too far from a couple billion dollars, but I hear ya. Um, no, and that's great to have books out. Like if you have books suggestions, it's a fantastic way to learn about wine. Um, Emily has started a Pinterest board with books, so feel free to um, post or pin any of those books that you're mentioning on our Pinterest board. Okay. Anything else? We have quite a few coming in with our ideas. All right. So um, Emily was saying a story and like a locavore story. Um, kind mm. of tying that all in. Okay, locavore and the local movement. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, celebrity endorsements. That's what I was saying. Celebrity endorsements, yeah. I mean, we saw on our Facebook page this week, uh, Drew Barrymore. We've got, you know, Dave Matthews. All these people coming in with um, interesting endorsements. Yeah. Anything yeah, else? So a couple more comments just on the celebrity. I think everyone's in agreement with that. And winemakers using Twitter mm -hmm. regarding upcoming vin vintages. So Kim said, you know, a really catchy label, kind mm -hmm. of the story. Definitely. 
Well, I'm gonna throw my two cents out there. I'm gonna say maybe wine education. So. <laughs> wine cast. <laughs> wine cast. Wine cast with uh, my wine school. Maybe I don't know. Like I don't. Okay, that's because I'm at the end of the glass. Okay, I had with if if I wasn't a good marketer, I wouldn't have planted that in your ear tonight. Okay, so with that, we are going to sign off. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for being a part of this great conversation. I had so much fun preparing for it, and um, I agree, Michael. We need a lot more time to talk about a uh, hundred years of wine marketing in the U.S. But um, if you liked what you saw, invite your friends over next time. Uh, treat them to a glass of wine and some wine education. Next Wednesday, we'll be doing the Rhone Blends in Australia, so that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us. I'm Jessica Bell from My Wine School, where it is wine your way.